Welcome to One Week Critiques, the interview series. I'm Adam al Sergani, and today I'm here with Shannon K. Winston. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much for having me. Shannon's poems have appeared in Rhino, Crab Creek Review, The Citron Review, The Los Angeles Review, Zone 3, and elsewhere. Her work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and several times for the Best of the Net. Her poetry collection, The Girl Who Talked to Paintings, is forthcoming next year? Next year, yeah. 2021, I think, or 2022. Cool. So The Girl Who Talked to Paintings is coming out in 2021, 2022 on Glass Liar Press. She currently lives and works in Princeton, New Jersey. You can find her at shannonkwinston.com. So Shannon, is there anything that I have missed in that... Um, no, that was that was great. I live with two dogs and I have been writing poems about them. I guess that's all I would add. <laughs> cool. I think that's probably the most important thing. I actually have a dog underneath the table who's happy to hear that. Yes. <laughs> into literature. Um, so today we're going to be talking about your poem, Mirrors. It's had several titles, originally titled The Gift. Um, we're going to be taking a look at its development. Would you mind reading the earliest version of Mirrors for us? Not at all. The Gift. If you think mirrors only reflect your own image back to you, think again. Rainbows overflowing in a plastic bucket. Coffee grounds taking on S and L shapes in their own bitter language. I've seen it all a blue feather atop a silver scale, just sitting there registering time. At first, these images skimmed the surface of the glass, but then I felt puppet strings between my hands as if I were pulling each image into view. Or were they pulling me? Pulling me into scenes of tenderness and loss, a man buttoning up his grandson's shoes, a little girl kneeling on the sidewalk to feed her dog, an old widow whispering into the knot of an oak tree. So you'll understand then why that day in July in Italy years ago, when my sister stepped off the train so thin, so unrecognizable, I held up a hand mirror not so she could see what she had learned to hate, but to offer up another distant world. The one within her, teeming, alive, glinting, knife-like. Very cool. Thank you for reading that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting to read it after so many years. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, oh, that's where the poem started. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when did you actually start? writing this piece? It was January um, 2018. Okay, so it's been a couple of years in development. It has uh, been. And you've, um, you sent me, it's gone through a lot of development. You sent me, I think, four versions of the poem. Um, and usually we look at a, a first and, and final or last version or published version. Uh, I know a lot of writers think of a published version as a still adaptable version including myself. Um, but um, today we're going to be looking at a few of those, I think because of that really tremendous process you've gone through in the wild adaptations. Um, it interests me about those drafts that you have had both form and content changes, um, as well as that you've lost and regained elements that you haven't just sort of taken a block of clay and sculpted it down, but you've in fact taken pieces off and re-added them um, to the poem. Um, so before we get too far into that, um, can you tell me a little bit about your general process of writing mirrors and how this poem develops and, and why it gets edited in that pull in, pull out kind of way? Mm 
Yeah, um, and I think we'll elaborate some of these uh, upon some of these issues later. But I, so I wrote this very quickly, and I wrote it actually during my final residency at, at Warren Wilson, and um, we had about. 15 minutes to generate a draft. And so I found myself kind of pouring all of these different images into the poem. Um, and then in the revision process, and I'd be happy to talk about this further, kind of interrogating the role of each image. And I think when I was drafting, it was like, oh, I love like coffee grounds, and then I'm gonna add this, and, and then how about a plastic bucket? And so, um, I think it was very much a stream of consciousness and um, and also kind of playing around with point of view and, and pronouns at first. And then as I kind of had distance from the poem, kind of interrogating those choices a lot more. Cool. Um, I think that's really interesting. And it's one of the, the way in which you interrogate those choices is one of the reasons I'm, I'm hoping we can actually look at several of these versions. So before we move farther on. I'm hoping you'll look with us or read for us one of the middle versions. Uh, this one is uh, has the amazing title of Mirrors is Tiny Hot Air Balloons. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And I should say that this draft came, um, if it's of interest, about a year after that first, after the gift. Um, Mirrors is Tiny Hot Air Balloons. A pink dolphin, a blue feather, atop a silver scale, glass-winged butterflies. I used to think mirrors could only reflect my own image back to me, but I was wrong. Begonia, begonias bloom in bathtubs. A man bikes with an upside-down colander on his head. A girl jumps rope around her neck tiny hot air balloons that lift her higher and higher into the sky. Years ago, when my mother, sorry, when my sister stepped off a train after a summer away, so thin, so unrecognizable, I held up a mirror. Not so she could see the body she had learned to hate, but to offer up another view of fire rainbows, of ships rusting in the desert sun, of, of clouds rippling across salt flats. I parsed each scene out in grams, careful to gift it to her one by one, spoon by spoon, so she'd not be toppled by its weight. Very good. Thank you for reading that. I. I really love that version. I, I think this poem develops in a tremendously interesting way. One thing that happens in an early, or some of these earlier versions that actually stays, that doesn't come in and out, is you develop what I'm calling a kind of hall of mirrors shape about the poem. Maybe I'm reading too much. <laughs> no, I love, I love that. That's great, yeah. <laughs> um, what about that change in shape and the, the spacing of the poem and how it looks on the page is important to you and how did that come about and why is it stayed? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship between form and, form and content. And um, so the, the emotional context of this poem is that it's about um, an eating disorder and kind of grappling with that and presenting alternative views for how to how to respond to that. But I, I kind of found personally um, that the short lines, like having short lines mirror the struggle of an eating disorder, like there was almost like too much of a parallelism between the form and the content there. And also kind of thinking about the imaginative impulse as existing intention with um, the restraint of, of an eating disorder. So kind of thinking about um, a gesture. And, and I think it varies. I, I clung on to the title, Gift. And I think while drafting this, um, in addition to your beautiful reading of uh, the lines as kind of reflections or mirrors, um, 
I really saw like long lines as, as part of that gift, right? Rather than like mirroring the restraint that's happening between the speaker's sister um, and in her life being like, take up room, right? Like use the page. Um, and there was something really freeing about that too. Um, yeah, I think that's, there's a lot I'm curious about, about the eating disorder and how that emerges in the poem and out of just a list of images of mirrors, because there is a, the sister is a character early on and it's, um, I don't want to say slyly, that sounds like <laughs> you're trying to get something over on the, um, but the body that she'd learned to hate is a, mm -hmm. such a compelling way to approach that or what she'd learned to hate. I don't think it's the body in the first person. Yeah, it's it's such a difficult topic, and I and I think um, more and more. I, I actually just took a workshop um, on this last week, but more and more, I'm interested in poems that announce their emotional situation like later on in the poem, or that approach it elliptically or through kind of a side door, and um, and I had such a personal investment in this topic. Um, and I found myself like really unable to write about it in sort of any kind of um, effective way because every time I kind of sat down, it was sort of like um, pouring myself onto the page and in not very um, interesting ways, uh, maybe important ways personally, but like artistically not so much. And I also just wondered like what would happen if I took like if I started in this very sort of fantastical imaginative space and really kind of brought in the sister later and kind of thinking about that delay a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's a phenomenal question about difficult material and how to present it here. And you do that in several different ways. One of which is your original draft of this is, is in the second person, which, um, I sort of poorly noted to you in our email chain uh, is sometimes in literature, it functions sort of as the first person. You are doing this, you are doing that. Um, or it has that kind of strangely looking at you, maybe accusational effect. And I'm, I'm wondering a couple things about the choice to sort of to shift to the first person and then to allow this, uh, this distancing through that to happen and how that editorial choice came about for you and what it does for you in particular in this poem. Yeah, um, you know, it was funny because I, um, I really struggle. I love this, the second person in poems, but I really struggle with it not sounding didactic. And so when I, um, when I showed earlier versions of this to workshops and to my friends, especially that first line, if you think um, mirrors, right? And a lot of my friends, much to my um, chagrin, were like, I never, I never thought that. Um, and so they, like, I immediately encountered, like, very interesting, like, reader resistance um, there. And I realized that that was me trying to create tension in the poem, but in the wrong place, right? And so I was sort of, um, I think, through revisions, kind of found that I was, like, trying to accuse the you of the reader of something that the reader might not have thought. Um, and by kind of pivoting that towards the speaker, right? Like I used to only think mirrors could do this one thing, but actually they do this other thing. Um, I, I at least find that the poem is like, opens a lot more into the speaker's interiority and own sort of reflective process of like, I, I kind of see this poem as like trying to make sense of what has happened. And um, I think when we were talking a little bit about it uh, in preparation for this interview, I sort of see the dramatic situation of the speaker talking to a third person and kind of making sense of this or trying to via the imagination. Yeah, I think there's a, across versions of this poem, there becomes a sort of dreamlike quality about mm -hmm 
the language and earlier versions, especially with the second person, they work through something that is about how it feels as though I, the speaker or the person reading it, am, am being told something about mirrors that I then come back around on. But there's a very different effect of reading this poem once it is in that first person, how mm -hmm. that communication happens between the two sisters um, in that context, partly because it feels more like the speaker is working through um, a series of imagined images in a more clear way. Um, I've been really fascinated about what those images are. <laughs> uh, well, do you mind if I speak to some of, some of them? So um, I think one of the, um, I love uh, imagery and images and, um, and as you can imagine, the girl who talked to paintings is um, an ekphrastic collection where uh, it's a lot of uh, meditation on art and how art sort of opens um, imaginative and personal like portals. Um, and so in this poem, I was trying to do a similar thing, but I had, um, I kind of drew on sort of random images in that first gift and in, in that first version. Um, and I also introduced characters who I, you know, and the characters weren't necessarily serving the poem. So, you know, the, the child and the, um, the older um, people in the poem, like they, I realized that they were um, maybe compelling for a different poem, but not really serving the speaker. Sure. Um, and and then I became really fascinated. I took notes, so I have to look um, by uh, drawing on like very unusual images that I had actually seen. So I have a neighbor where, and this neighbor is um, kind of eccentric. And one day I was in a cafe and saw my neighbor riding his bike with a colander on his head, in place of a helmet. Um, and I started, so I started looking at like actual geographies. So when um, in this version that I read, fire rainbows are our scientific phenomenon um, and ships resting in the desert sun um, that actually is a place. Um, and in Bolivia, um, there are these like gorgeous salt flats. And so I was trying to like think about, okay, well, how can I bring in like things that actually happen, but that seems like, so, that seems so strange and so fantastical in nature. So rather than sort of like, oh, I'm thinking of coffee ground. So let me just throw them into a poem, kind of thinking about alternate geographies as like metaphors also of like alternate bodies and, and for the for the um, sister figure. Um, and that was super interesting to kind of think about. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fascinated by that because I think over time and in this last version of the poem that we're about to look at, it feels as though the objects in the poem still have something of a, a spontaneous kind of Nietzschean lightning bolt quality or something. And there's nevertheless, uh, I think, on a close inspection, a lot of decay and, and maintaining of, of sharpness and that geographical dislocation as part of it that makes the conclusion of the poem and confronting the sister with a mirror feels still coherent to what all of those images are working through. Yeah, and I think too that when I when I came to um, the sentence, I parsed each scene out in grams, that really became a metaphor for the writing process. I didn't even intend it, but you know, I had like so many images on the page. It was like, what actually makes sense to stay in? And I think that part of it too, um, I'll just say like one last thing, because um, uh, that um, some, of the, some of the images I found like overly sentimental. Yeah. And I really wanted to like, for example, 
um, glass wing butterflies. Um, you know, it was an image I loved at the time and when I wrote it and it sounds beautiful, but it was like, is that really serving the, the poem? And then um, I had been reading about the pink dolphin in the news. I don't know if you heard about that, I but that, that's also, that was a real phenomenon. And so, but I had a friend and I think rightly so say, well, maybe like, maybe the pink dolphin and the blue feather don't both belong in the poem, like maybe choose one. And so part of the question too was like, how strange do I want to get with these images? And <laughs> And um, and there was a time, I think even in mirrors as tiny hot air balloons, where um, the strangeness of the imagery kind of drown out the sister's yeah. story. And so it was also, I think you mentioned at the start of the interview, that really kind of putting images down, pruning them back, inserting some, taking some out, and then figuring out which ones really belong in the poem and which ones don't. Sure, very yeah. cool. Well, speaking of which ones belong in the poem, can we take a look at the final version? Sure. Uh, unquote, final version of it? Yeah. Cool. Mirrors. I once thought mirrors could only reflect my own image back to me, but I was wrong. As a child, I'd sneak into the bathroom, rise up on my tiptoes, and lift my grandmother's hand mirror off the highest shelf. At first, I glimpsed my frayed and sweat-stained nightgown, but after a while, distant worlds came into relief. A blue feather atop a scale, begonias blooming in clawfoot tubs. Some days I'd see a girl jumping rope and tiny hot air balloons skimming the frame's edge turned sky. Years later, when my sister stepped off a train after a summer away, so thin, so unrecognizable, I held up a mirror. Not so she could see the body she had learned to hate, but to offer up another view of clouds rippling across salt flats, of sweet onion cradled in dirt, of waterfalls backlit by fire. I divvied out these scenes in grams and gifted them to her, one by one, spoon by spoon, so she'd not be toppled by their weight. Very cool. Thank you so much for reading that. Yeah. I, I think that last version strikes me really hard in part because of the way that imagery starts to integrate with the process of the sister and the surreality of feeding someone who's ill or, or childlike and that in those small measures that um i i really dig that last version <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> uh, yeah so but it's um it's not going to be in your forthcoming book the girl who talked painting mm -hmm. um you mentioned that um, that book is a little bit more about ekphrasis and about um, other ways of seeing um, but can you tell us a little bit what else that book is doing and, and how it relates to this piece and your overall project as a poet slash uh, thinker about dogs? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I haven't figured out how dogs figure into my poetry yet. That's, I think that's for a, a future work. But yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm really interested in, in form and thinking about how the personal um, can be brought out by specifically images and the senses. And I would say that my, um, the girl who talked to paintings is really about how, how to use ekphrasis as, as a form to open inner worlds and stories that couldn't be told otherwise. And so in some of my poems, um, 
it's, it's some of the poems kind of stage um, characters coming alive in paintings or speakers um, imagining themselves into paintings. And, um, and in that sense, I really see mirrors as, as part of that project, but going in a slightly different direction and kind of thinking about reflections and refractions between um, the speakers and, and what is being seen and observed. Very cool. And um, is most of that, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question in some ways, right? Like thinking about a mirror is a sort of ekphrasis. It's a, an illusion of yourself. Mm -hmm. I think your poem brings out mm -hmm. a tremendously interesting way in part by negotiating the difficult question of, of what it is to have body dysmorphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are um, are some of the poems that you're working through in that book also about um, is it pure crassus in the sense that it's I'm always looking at Guernica or mm -hmm. that um, does it have variations on that talking to paintings and yeah I, I think it's so um, I think that project really started with um, the premise and kind of thinking, okay, well, people have imaginary friends, but what if people had imaginary friends in paintings? And so the, um, the, the collection really is about um, kind of family trauma um, and absent father figure and the speaker kind of communicating with paintings as a way of trying to resolve that um, that and there's there are also poems about um, grapples with sexuality and language and kind of thinking about how do you find words to um, to put those experiences in into writing but also I think that the paintings in some way give the the different speakers a form and, and a way into those stories. And I think when you were talking about mirrors as um, you didn't you didn't use the word projection, but I was thinking it like kind of what happens when you project your own story into a painting or into a mirror and what exactly gets refracted back at, at you and, and to you. Um, and so kind of thinking, I'm also really interested in like shyness in, in poems and how poems can become vehicles for grappling with um, stories that people are either afraid to tell or um, haven't found words. And so I think that um, that using paintings as sort of a launching point into the imagination um, was a huge part of that project too. Very, very cool. yeah. So Shannon, um, as always, folks can find us at oneweekcritique.com, which is the number one. Mm -hmm. They can find uh, both the earliest version and the latest mm -hmm. version of your poem there. Um, as we mentioned, uh, you have a website, shannonkwinston.com, and later this year, early next year, somewhere in there, Glass Liar Press is going to have the girl who talked to paintings. Uh, where else can people find your work and what you're up to and follow your trajectory or have you as a teacher? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. So my website is the best place to find me. I have uh, my email there and my recent publications. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking about this poem. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.